Good evening from Colombo, Sri Lanka. This is Dr. Pamo Damarakon representing Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka. I would like to warmly welcome all of you around the globe for the special Ahinawar G2MC Grand Rounds. Rapid advances in genome sequencing technologies, bioinformatics, and computational bi biology is heralding in an era of genomic medicine. The series of lectures conducted by the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, supported by the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka and the Asia eHealth Information Network, will showcase some of the pioneering initiatives in genomic medicine from around the globe. The series would be co-hosted by Professor Bruce Kov from the University of Alabama in Birmingham, United States, and Professor Vajra Visanayake from the University of Colombo, the co-chairs of the Educational Working Group of G2MC. Before moving on to today's session, I'll briefly mention a few things to remember while using WebEx platform. Once you have logged into WebEx, the left panel is where you shall see the content presented by the panelists, including PowerPoint presentations, videos, etc. The right panel contains some useful tools. If you click on participants icon, it will display all the panelists and attendees currently logged in to the event. The Q&A button can be used to ask questions from the panelists. You can also provide feedback during the presentation by clicking on applause, yes, no, too fast, too slow, and laughter buttons. Please note that your microphone will be automatically muted once you join in as an attendee. If you encounter any issues in receiving audio during the webinar, please log out from the WebEx platform and try to re-log in. With this brief introduction on WebEx, I would like to invite Professor Vajra Disanayake, the co-chair of the Education Working Group of the G2MC, to moderate today's session. Over to you, Professor Disanayake. Thank you, Pamod. Good evening, everybody from Sri Lanka. Today, this is the fourth edition of the Genomic, uh, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative Grand Rounds. And uh, we have with us Dr. David Carey, uh, the Director of the Vice Center for Research at the Geisinger Health System in USA. Regeneron um, Genomic Center and uh, the Geisinger Health System has been doing some wonderful work. And uh, today, uh, Dr. David Carey would present to us about Regeneron Geisinger Discover EHR program. Over to you, uh, Dr. Carey. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, again, to the organizers, thanks very much for the invitation to speak, um, and good morning from the eastern, east coast of the U.S. Uh, to all my colleagues around the world. So what I'm going to do is, is tell you about, um, give you an update on where we are in the Geist and Regeneron uh, Discover collaboration. And you see the subtitle of my talk is Leveraging the Resources of an Integrated Healthcare Delivery System for Translational Research. So I work for Geisinger, which is um, half of the Geisinger Regeneron uh, collaboration. So I'm going to give a, a perspective from a healthcare system in the U.S. And so um, I think it'll be, um, I, th I think a little bit different perspective than what you might be used to hearing. So, Controls aren't working. Where? Let's see. Okay. So I thought I'd start by just explaining um, what the collaboration is, uh, sort of the who, the, the what, and the why. So it's a collaboration between Geisinger Health System, and we're a not-for-profit integrated healthcare system located in uh, in the Pennsylvania, in the northeastern United States. And Regeneron Genetic Center, which is a subsidiary of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, their headquarters is in Terrytown, New York. And the goal is to carry out exome sequence analysis of consented Geisinger patients and to link that genomic data to the longitudinal clinical data that we have here in our electronic health record database. And the purpose then is to create a platform for genomic discovery um, for, for drug development, and as I'll show near the end of my talk today, uh, we're beginning to do implementation of genomic information into our clinical practice here at Geisinger. 
So a uh, brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. So um, I thought I'd explain why Geisinger is doing this and why we think this is a, a, a great platform for doing genomics research, both at, at the discovery and the clinical implementation level. Then I'll share some of the initial results from the collaboration. Um, we have now sequenced data on a little bit more than 50,000 individuals from our health system. And then uh, show some uh, gene phenotype associations uh, more as examples of the kinds of things that we're doing. And then end up uh, talking about what we call our Genome First Return of Results Project, which is um, our efforts to do clinical implementation of this information. So this slide uh, really um, illustrates what we think are the key elements that Geisinger provides that make it a, a, a great engine for translational research. And I'm going to explain each of these a little bit uh, more in, in some slides that are coming up. So we are an integrated healthcare delivery system. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute. We have a very supportive and non-transitory patient population. Uh, so a little bit more about that. But I'm really going to spend most of my time focusing on two other aspects of what I think are key. One is uh, our electronic medical record infrastructure which provides a source of longitudinal clinical data that we use for research. And then the, the, the last one is our centralized biobank uh, of, of blood, DNA, and, and in some cases, tissue samples from, from Geisinger patients. They're linkable to that electronic uh, medical record data as a, as a driver of, um, of research. Uh, we're also very interested in sort of closing the gap and bringing that information back to our patients to our electronic health records, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit at the end how we're doing that. So we're an integrated healthcare system. What that means um, is that we have um, all, all facets of the healthcare delivery process uh, integrated into a single uh, company under the head of a single uh, president and chief executive officer. So guys in your clinic, um, employs um, more than a thousand physicians who all work for the health system and provide care to our patients. And it, it's also the, the employer of a number of other um, uh, providers, uh, PAs and nurse practitioners, et cetera. And it covers uh, everything from primary care to advanced specialty care. So all the, nearly all the physicians that uh, care for our patients are employed by the system. We also own the inpatient and outpatient facilities where the care is provided. So that includes two large um, teaching hospitals here in Pennsylvania, plus a network of other smaller uh, regional and community hospitals, and then a network of uh, community-based primary and specialty care sites um, that provide both outpatient and uh, ambulatory surgery care. And then the third piece is, is what we call Geisinger Health Plan, that's our insurance company. So we also are the insurers of not all of our patients, but many of our patients who get care here. So all those report up to a single uh, uh, chief executive officer and a single board of directors. And if you're not familiar with the uh, state of healthcare in the US, this is an unusual degree of integration of all these facets of healthcare. Um, and it really uh, helps us um, both deliver and then have, have data on uh, pretty much the complete package of care that our, that our patients receive. And, and as you'll see, I think that's um, a great advantage for the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, if you're familiar with the geography of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and Northeastern US, um, the area indicated uh, here in these three um, uh, shapes is the primary patient catchment area where um, we provide our services. And if you're familiar with Philadelphia, it's down here in the north, uh, in the southeastern uh, corner. Uh, Pittsburgh, the other uh, major city within the Commonwealth, is located over here in the northwestern corner. You see, we cover most of the rest of the Commonwealth, uh, or the state of Pennsylvania, and this is a mostly rural area, so there are no major population centers here. There are about two, two and a half million people that live in this region, but they're all scattered in, in a number of small rural towns uh, and townships. So it's, a, it's a, a very unusual demography, but it gives us a very stable patient base. So people here, um, they don't move around a lot. The migration in and out of the region is, is fairly low. There are a lot of multi-generation families that live here and receive care through guys here. And I, I, I'll touch on that later uh, as an advantage for some of the things that we're doing uh, later on. 
So I want to say a few words about um, our health IT infrastructure, which is really one of our, I think, our key assets. Um, so we use EPIC as our transactional electronic health record uh, system. And the decision to implement EPIC was made here at Geisinger in, uh, in the mid-1990s. And then over the next five or six years was fully implemented across all sites of care within the system, both inpatient and outpatient. And so we um, did this we were one of the first large systems in the U.S. to, to adopt uh, electronic health records. And so now that means that um, we have longitudinal um, data that's collected during patient encounters with the system uh, going back many years. And I'll show some data in a minute. So there's lots of data. So in the period from 2004 to 2012, there were over 13 million outpatient encounters that are recorded. Um, uh, we're now over 2 million outpatient encounters uh, per year. And you can see other, other data there on about uh, um, unique patients and hospital admissions. So a very large and longitudinal uh, electronic clinical database. And we cover pretty much the entire suite of uh, what the EHR can do. So we're recording both outpatient and inpatient data, uh, emergency department. Uh, we use computerized physician order entry, uh, all prescribing of medications is done electronically. Lab orders uh, and test results are available. Procedures, diagnoses, um, dem demographic data. We also have a, a digital um, imaging database. We want to look at um, radiologic data and, and, and pretty much everything else. A very complete electronic health record. So um, I'm a biologist. I'm very interested in health genes and molecules affect health and disease. So um, with some of my colleagues here at Geisinger, we started thinking about how we could leverage this integrated system and all this clinical data to do um, genomic and other types of molecular translational research. And so we decided to uh, try to create a system-wide biorepository of blood and DNA samples that we would bank for broad future research use. Uh, we started this as a pilot program in 2006. And as part of that, we wanted to um, be able to link the samples and the, and the data from the samples to the participants' uh, Geisinger clinical data. And so that was uh, the project that now we call the Geisinger MyCode project. Uh, in 2000. 13, we decided that um, we, we, we modified this program a little bit to allow us to return uh, medically actionable information to patients, and I'll say more about that uh, at the end. So MyCode really then forms um, kind of the hub for many of the translational genomics research activities that we do here. So I'll just sort of run through a little bit of the, the elements of what it means to be a MyCode participant for a guy senior patient. So, it is uh, patients enroll through an opt-in informed consent process. So we have an IRB protocol that's been approved since 2006. So the participation is voluntary and the patients can withdraw at any time in the future and for any reason. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the IRB and the HIPAA regulations in the US, uh, we use a combined uh, research consent and HIPAA, HIPAA authorization document that gives us permission uh, from the patients to use information that's collected as part of their health care for research. Um, the patients know that they may not derive any direct benefit from participating. They do it um, just because they think it's something that's worthwhile doing. Uh, we let them know that their decision won't have any impact on, on their medical care, uh, but also they uh, give us permission to use information in their geisinger health, health record for research. Another interesting um, sort of um, addition we made to the consent is that patients give us permission to be contacted in the future. That's been useful for other studies where we need to uh, get additional information or maybe want to invite them to participate in, in another research study. We also want to let them know that the samples and data uh, might be shared with other researchers, uh, including commercial companies. That was obviously important for the collaboration that we did uh, with Regeneron. We were sharing the samples and some some patient data with with um, with Regeneron uh, investigators. <clears throat> but we did do tell them that we'll take um, steps to protect their privacy uh, and the security of their of their data. So the patients are enrolled uh, when they come in for an outpatient visit. Uh, we enroll patients through both primary and specialty clinics. Uh, there's also an option for online enrollment through a secure patient portal. And we have trained uh, 
MyCode consenters that we put in clinics to engage with the patients when they come in. Uh, we can use the uh, clinic schedules and the electronic health record data to generate eligibility lists. And when a patient uh, agrees to uh, participate and they sign the consent form, then that, that's entered into their health record. And that creates an automated blood order that's activated when they have ne their next outpatient blood draw. So most of the samples are collected when patients come in for blood work that their uh, clinical provider has ordered. <clears throat> and that's important because we, one of the things we've done is try to make this as easy as possible for the patients to enroll. So it doesn't require an extra visit to the clinic. It doesn't even require, in most cases, an extra vena puncture. And I think that helps contribute to some of the very high rates of, of consent that we get. And I'll show you some numbers in a little bit. Uh, because we're now using uh, the samples for some results that we're returning to patients and putting in their health record, uh, the, bi the MyCode Biobank, the DNA repository, is now CLIA certified. It's been CLIA certified now for a little bit over a year, and we do collect serial blood samples when they come back um, from um, their visits. To, ma to make this process um, scalable and also um, to reduce the overall cost for doing this. Um, in this entire process, and the process is outlined here in a, in a flow chart, we, we used whenever possible the existing infrastructure. So either our health IT infrastructure or existing clinical workflows. And so um, some of those are listed here, but to give you an example, so we use our EPIC electronic medical record system to, um, to track patients who've been consented and then to initiate the automated blood draw order when they visit a, a Geisinger Clinic phlebotomist in the future. Um, so the samples are collected by our very large and very efficient uh, clinical laboratory system. So we can get a sample from a MyCode participant um, when they have blood drawn uh, at a Geisinger facility at any of the more than 80 Geisinger facilities scattered throughout this region. All the samples are transferred then to a central clinical processing lab it's all done as part of the, the clinical lab process, and then we retrieve the MyCode samples and bring them to the genomics lab for, for later on. So I think doing that and embedding this into the clinical workflow, uh, I think, has, um, has, has had a number of advantages, including uh, making this much more scalable. So our participation rates are shown here. Um, we, we, so there's no age limit to the MyCode uh, eligibility, so we can uh, we, we've actually, our, our youngest MyCode participant was uh, enrolled through parental consent uh, on the day of birth, so right in the delivery um, delivery clinic. And then, uh, so there's no upper age limit as well. So of the patients that we've um, engaged uh, during a visit to invite them to consider participating, we got overall about an 85% uh, enrollment rate, which is uh, which is which is fairly high, and we think is is contributing to large numbers we have. And also, I think helps us ensure that we're not getting a, a biased sampling of our patients. So it's a pretty representative sample of the Geisinger outpatient population. These show the enrollment numbers. You can see we started uh, uh, active enrollment in 2007, and it was steadily increasing. And beginning in 2014, with a big bump in 2015, we've uh, really ramped up enrollment. We now have over 115,000 enrolled participants, and we're still actively enrolling um, at a rate of a, an average of about 800 new participants per week. So um, we, we passed the 100,000 mark, uh, which was one of our targets. So we're now thinking that we try to go to 250,000 or perhaps even more with the goal of eventually approaching every Geisinger patient to see if they'd be willing to, uh, to participate. So to give you an idea of, of uh, what fraction of the total Geisinger uh, patient population it is, uh, so there are about 1.4 million people that have a Geisinger record. Um, so that's about 10% of those. But of those, um, we're guessing between 500,000 and 700,000 patients are uh, sort of active members um, who get the bulk or all of their health care through, uh, through the Geisinger Health System. So we, you know, we're approaching perhaps 20% of that. So there's st still more, um, more room for growth, and, and we're, we have some pretty aggressive plans on, on scaling that. So I mentioned that 
uh, health record data is just uh, showing that um, we have over 400,000 individuals in Geisinger with 10 years or more of longitudinal data. Um, this is the data on duration of health record data on microwave participants. Um, shown here, this is a funny looking curve, but this, uh, this spike indicates a major uh, implementation effort here at Geisinger. And then the number of clinical encounters per microwave participant are shown here, and you see and stratified by age, uh, over 55 or less than 55, and you can see that uh, we have lots of clinical encounters from which we're recording data for these patients. This is the age distribution. So I mentioned there's, uh, this is for the, for the adult participants, and you see we go up to uh, over 89. We, oh, we do oversample, um, not deliberately, but I think it's because of um, probably a couple of factors, including frequency of visiting the clinics, so uh, more opportunities to engage them. But we are, um, we have oversampled some of the older um, population. So to, again, to give you an idea of the data, so these are, um, this is for Geisinger Health System. The top um, chart shows the most common office visit diagnoses. You see hypertension, we have uh, 250,000, uh, hyperlipidemia, about 175,000. Uh, type 2 diabetes is almost 150,000. So very, very large um, um, sort of uh, patient cohort with, with multiple um, uh, chronic diseases. And then lab values are shown here. So uh, we, we routinely collect uh, labs on, on, on very large numbers of our patients. So creatinine, we have over 7 million measurements, uh, same for glucose, uh, uh, urea, nitrogen, sodium, uh, the usual sort of metabolic panel things. And then even for uh, some of the um, more rare tests, we're still in the millions. So really a lot of data that we have to, to bring to bear to, uh, to, uh, to study these patients. So we spent a lot of time and effort um, sort of managing the um, sort of the access to and the flow of data with respect to this. And some of that's illustrated here. So um, nearly all the data that we use for these projects comes from patient encounters with the health system. So it's initially recorded mainly in our electronic health record system. But we can also use other, because we have an insurance company, we can also pull in claims data. We have financial data, their operational data. And all of that goes into um, what's shown here is the CDIS, which is our clinical decision intelligence system, which is our, our, our um, enterprise data warehouse. So it consolidates data from those multiple sources. But because this information was collected as part of the healthcare process, it's protected behind the PHI firewall by federal regulations in the U.S. And so unless, it, unless it's used for treatment, payment, or operations um, for clinical care, we need special permission to use that. So we do have an IRB protocol, actually a series of IRB protocols to manage that. And the primary way we do that is through what we call a data broker. So this is a, a um, sort of an analyst who has permission to access this data and then um, distribute it to uh, investigators who have appropriate um, permission. Um, and in some cases, um, they've also created a, what we call a phenomic initiative database, which is a sort of a research-ready, de-identified database that many investigators can access, again, with appropriate permissions. So the biobank, which is the microbiobank, biobank, um, access to those samples is controlled by a governing board, and so investigators will request access to those samples, and they can get them, either the samples or the data. And then the data broker can also, uh, maintains a key that allows the clinical data and the sample data to be linked, um, in most cases, uh, in a de-identified fashion, but not in every case uh, for research purposes. So this outlines sort of how we manage that flow of, of information and, and samples. So because we're using um, the medical record data for research, um, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, it's not what you would always consider um, research-grade data. So it does take some effort to clean the data and then um, you come up with useful algorithms that make it appropriate um, for, uh, say, case control studies uh, if we want to do that. So the, the sort of the basic um, outline of how we do that is shown here. So you come up with a research idea, then we can do initial queries of our data, uh, refine that idea, uh, do some feasibility tests, 
And during that time, we'll look at the, the types of data that are, that are informative uh, for identifying either inclusion or exclusion or identifying cases and controls. And some of the types of data that we might put into some of these algorithms are listed here. Uh, we'll then run the phenotype algorithm uh, executed against uh, the EMR data. And then um, we typically will then do a sort of an expert chart review of a selected number of, of charts to see how accurate the the aneurys that sort of the the algorithm is with respect to calculating a positive and negative predictive value. In many cases, it requires some some iterative refinement, but um, I think it's it's a process that if um, if done carefully can be extremely powerful and gives us a, a, a lot of flexibility in terms of the kinds of, of projects that we can do using existing data, which is the main advantage. So now let me, so that's a sort of a brief summary of some of the elements that Geisinger Health System um, brings to the collaboration and some of the advantages we have for doing um, some of the genomic projects that we're, that we're, we're undertaking. Um, so now I'm gonna come back to the collaboration. And so this slide just lists the main operational elements of the collaboration. So I explained sort of in broad terms what we want to do. But operationally, um, sort of it comes down to really um, th these things. So we're expanding the microbiobank, biobank, and I showed you some numbers on that. Um, we're also investing in, um, in developing infrastructure and, and expertise to develop, continue to develop and refine our use of our Geisinger EHR data for patient phenotyping. Um, and then really what Regeneron is bringing to the table is their uh, ability to do a high throughput genomic analysis. And the next slide um, will give you a little bit more details on that. So our initial goal when we started the collaboration was to do a minimum of 25,000 exome sequences over five years. So we're now about two and a half years into the collaboration and we've now sequenced over 50,000 patients. So we've now um, our, our target now is to try to get to 100,000 sometime by the end of calendar 2016 or early 2017, with our five-year goal now, um, you know, being much higher than that. Uh, we're also doing other genomic analysis, including um, Illumina uh, genome-wide genotyping. Um, there's also an element of patient and provider engagement. Um, I mentioned that through MyCode we can recontact patients. So we're using that to collect supplemental data that we need to, um, to refine a phenotype, for example, or to invite participants to, to, um, to sign up for, for a follow-up research study. We also use this to engage our Geisinger clinical experts here who are sort of in the front lines of providing care because their input is often very important in terms of um, deciding what projects to pursue and then how to, how to use and interpret the clinical data. Then in terms of government, governance, uh, the collaboration is overseen by um, a joint steering committee that has equal representation from, from the two partners, Geisinger and, and Regeneron. So at Regeneron, they've um, invested in, uh, in technologies and automation for high throughput sequencing and some of the capabilities shown here. They have a large automated biobank. Um, they've fully automated the um, library prep uh, for um, Illumina next generation sequencing, and they have a fleet, a fleet of Illumina sequencers, uh, some of which are shown in, in the photograph here. It gives them very high capacity for generating uh, exome sequences, a um, rate of um, almost 2,000 per week, which is, a, to me, an extraordinarily high number. Um, the other innovative thing that they've done is um, all, all of the data storage and the data analytics, including the variant calling uh, and the mapping, is done in, in a cloud-based uh, computing environment. So um, it's something they're very proud of, and I think they've done a great job of, uh, of developing that capacity. So that's how we at Geisinger access the data is, is all through cloud-based uh, storage and uh, uh, makes it very easy for data sharing and also um, I think that the, um, the data security is, is uh, something that we were concerned about, but we decided is, is actually very, very tight uh, in our cloud, uh, in, in the cloud environment that we're using. So now some, uh, some of the results. So I'm going to show some data from the first approximately 51,000 um, participants that were sequenced. 
Um, <laughs> excuse me. So um, these are these are all happen to be adult patients um, that were in this data set. So not surprisingly, we found um, lots of variants. Um, over 4.2 million total variants. Most of those single nucleotide variants. So you see over 4 million of those. And if we break it down by um, a little frequency uh, less than or equal to 1% in the population, you see the vast majority of variants that we're seeing are, uh, are low frequency variants, which is not surprising. And this panel shows the distribution of, um, of variants uh, as a function of their um, uh, allele frequency within the population. And you can see that um, it's very heavily skewed towards the very low frequency variants. And in fact, about half the variants that we're seeing, um, we've seen only once in the population. So they're, they're unique within our population. Um, in this chart, we've also um, stratified the, um, the variants by their, um, some of the functional classifications. So synonymous, non-synonymous, and loss of function, the LOS. And you can see that the loss of functions are skewed even more uh, towards the low frequency and the rare variants. So we, we've um, tried to estimate um, with, with this sample size um, when we're reaching saturation with respect to sequence data. And so this just shows um, the percent of the autosomal genes that have at least one carrier with a predicted loss of function variant. Uh, and it's, again, it's stratified by numbers of individuals. So one individual uh, 5, um, 10, or 20. And you can see we have 92% um, of the genes have at least one heterozygous loss of function carrier. And 7% of genes uh, have um, at least one homozygous loss of function carrier, so a, 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 a human knockout uh, in essence. And you can see even for, uh, uh, you know, we're approaching 50% of the genes having 20 or more loss of function carriers. So. Um, we're, you know, we're continuing to enroll, we're continuing to sequence, so uh, we'll be, be interested to see um, how these curves um, look uh, in the future. So that's the data set that we're working with now, and I'm going to show you some, uh, some initial results. So in terms of the types of um, predicted loss of function variants that we're seeing, they're summarized here. So um, <clears throat> uh, stop gains and frame shifts are the most common. Um, the others are listed there as well. So, but um, on average, each uh, individual that's been sequenced in the cohort has uh, 21 predicted loss of function variants. So, um, again, similar to what's been reported in other large-scale sequencing projects. So, with this, these resources now, the clinical data we use to generate validated phenotypes, engagement with the patients to create the biobank, and then generate genomic data. Combining those gives us a lot of, gives us really a very high throughput pipeline to look at gene phenotype associations. And I'm going to first show some, uh, some specific research projects that we've done using this data. Again, not um, going into any of them in too much detail, but just to show you some of the power of this existing data to do some really interesting um, discovery research. And then later on, I'll come back to the clinical use of, of these resources. So we're using a number of analytic strategies. Um, some of it's focused hypothesis-driven queries, so really looking at um, asking the question whether variants in a specific gene are associated with the phenotypes. So, um, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Uh, we're also using more traditional phenotype-first strategies, so um, asking what genes or variants are associated with a particular clinical trait of interest. And we're looking at both common and rare variants, as well as, in some cases, uh, focusing on the loss of function variants. But we also have enough data now that we can take a, what we're calling a genotype-first approach, and that is um, start with some interesting variants uh, in a gene or a set of genes, and then asking what phenotypes are associated with that. So that's um, um, often called a phenome-wide association study, or a PHEWAS. So I'll give you an example of um, some, some targeted analyses. So um, a couple of years ago, this paper was published from a, the Lipid Working Group sequencing project. They reported um, some loss of function mutations, rare loss of function mutations in the APOC3 gene that affected um, blood lipid levels and coronary artery disease. 
and they had sequenced uh, about 3,700 individuals and identified some rare variants that were associated with triglyceride levels. So we um, sort of looked for these variants and other variants in APOC3 that were loss of function in our population. And this is in a data set, the first um, about 11,400 patients and found um, some of the same variants that were reported in that paper at a frequency, of about the same frequency as they reported. <clears throat> we have lots of uh, blood lipid levels. This just shows you a, a histogram of triglycerides on a cohort of about 300,000 Geisinger patients. So we now we then looked for associations between variants in the in the APOC3 gene and and uh, blood lipid levels. And I'll just show some of that data. So um, what we found was no association with um, LDL cholesterol levels, but we did see significant associations. Uh, in fact, increases in HDL levels in individuals that were uh, carrying these rare variants and decreases in triglyceride levels uh, in individuals that were, were harboring these variants. And it's shown a little bit here. So the triglycerides, so this is a large um, non-carrier um, cohort, uh, and these are individuals with three different, um, the three most common rare variants that we saw showing reduction in triglycerides. And over here, the same variants to increase in HDL. They were um, statistically significant. We've also looked at um, other genes that are associated with blood lipid levels. So ANGPTL4 is a protein that had been uh, previously uh, linked um, to, um, uh, to blood lipid levels and, and risk for cardiovascular disease. So we looked at that gene in our population. And um, so one of the um, variants that have been reported before is a um, uh, amino acid substitution, the E40K, and in our, in a, again, in a cohort of about 41,000 uh, patients that were sequenced, we found um, about 1,600 heterozygous carriers and 17 homozygous carriers. So these would be predicted uh, human knockouts of this. And we looked at their associations with triglycerides uh, and HDL, and you can see um, for triglycerides, um, reduction in the heterozygotes and it further reduction in the homozygotes, and then uh, increased um, levels of HDL uh, in those carriers with very, very significant p-values. And then even with those with other inactivating mutations, um, again, significant um, either decrease in triglycerides or, or uh, increase in HDL, um, but no effect on um, LDL cholesterol or total cholesterol. So we've also shown associations with uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so the, these protective effects, um, uh, 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 potential protective effects on lipids are also showing up as a, a decrease in rates of cardiovascular disease. Um, we, we've, this is a very busy table. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But we've looked at uh, sort of 10 uh, or I guess 11 um, approved or um, in, in uh, clinical trial drugs for lipid lowering um, and I looked to see whether the, um, we, we'd have genetic data that would support um, the effects of the drugs uh, clinically. And, and uh, just show, so PCSK9, K9, for example, there's a, uh, inhibitors of that that are in phase three um, clinical trials to decrease LDL. Uh, we found 52 uh, loss of function carriers, and they had the predicted uh, reduction in LDL cholesterol with no effects on other lipids. So again, it's a way, it's sort of a proof of principle that um, you can use um, genetic results of this kind to uh, validate and, and hopefully in the future identify novel um, targets for therapeutic development. Um, I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of these others, but we've done um, sort of more traditional genome-wide association studies. This is one for uh, blood calcium levels. We got very significant hits um, shown here uh, for the calcium sensing receptor. Uh, we're following up on that. Uh, we've also done uh, phenome-wide association studies, again, starting with a particular variant and then looking at a, a range of about 900 uh, clinical traits that are clustered into what we call fee codes. And then they're displayed here by um, sort of um, disease or clinical class. 
And when we did this for some SNPs in the APOE gene that have been associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, previously we got very highly significant associations with Alzheimer's disease as well as other dementias. Um, interesting here also for hyperlipidemia. So um, this is a way to, um, in many ways, generate new hypotheses about uh, associations of genes or genetic variants with clinical traits of interest. So we're also pursuing this. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, I, I, well, I mean, uh, so, so I mentioned um, the clinical population, and we suspected that um, patients were coming to care um, as families, obviously, to Geisinger. And when we looked at our um, database of now about 51,000 exome sequences, we were able to calculate um, genetically relatedness in the population. And some of the results are shown here. So we found um, 20 pairs of monozygotic twins, almost 5,000 pairs of uh, full siblings, 6,600 parent child uh, uh, dyads, um, number of second degree relatives, and a lot of third degree relatives. And it turns out that about half the people that we've sequenced have at least one first or second degree relative in the population. So we now have ways to um, computationally um, predict um, and determine pedigrees uh, within these family groups. And we're using that to, um, in some cases, to track rare variants that we think might be associated with particular clinical traits of interest. So I'm not, I, don't, I don't have any data to show on that today, but that's something that we're very interested in continuing to explore. So now I want to turn to um, how we're using this information clinically because um, I think this might be of, of, of interest to a number of folks um, that are listening in. So the starting point for this, um, well, let me just back up. So one of the things that we decided was that um, w with this data that we would have today in our hands information that could be medically useful for our patients. And that raised the question whether, as a healthcare delivery system, we had an obligation to share that information with our patients. So we put together um, uh, an internal working group of people with expertise in uh, clinical medicine and genetics uh, and ethics and, and, sort of, and, some, and some legal experts, sort of uh, look at that question. And we came to the conclusion that, yes, we, we did... Um, we should be doing that uh, when it's appropriate. So what I'm going to talk about now is the, the program that we developed to, to use the available data that we have today to try to implement that in, in clinical care. So the starting point for this um, was a, a policy statement that um, was published by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics in uh, 2013, where they identified 57 genes infected uh, a couple of dozen different conditions um, where they were, um, they recommended that um, in large data sets that um, these uh, very pathogenic mutations in this gene should be looked for and then reported when present. So that was our starting point for what we now call our Genome First Return of Results Project. So our initial focus is on 76 genes that affect 27 different clinical conditions. So it's the 56 ACMG recommended genes plus 20 that we've added. And so the, the primary conditions um, really are cancer predisposition. So that's 23 of the genes, 15 different um, <clears throat> cancer conditions, most common of which is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer uh, syndrome. Um, cardiovascular diseases account for uh, 50 of the genes in nine conditions, uh, the most common being cardiomyopathies and long QT syndrome. And then um, uh, nearly all of these genes uh, and the variants uh, are highly penetrant and mostly dominant. So um, <clears throat> that's why we decided um, to, to go along with the ACMG recommendations and focus on these types of genes. So the program uh, again, to remind you that MyCode uh, consent um, was modified to let the patients know that we do intend to return results that are medically actionable, and so when they sign up, they uh, uh, agree to that. We also tell them that we will not return um, um, information that is not medically actionable today. Um, 
so that the, the data that we're using for um, for this program starts with the the Regeneron generated sequence data, which is is not generated in a CLIA uh, sort of or clinical laboratory. And so we before we return the results, those are confirmed in a CLIA lab. Uh, there's a lot of oversight of this program, so there's a return of results oversight committee that um, sort of makes decisions on what variants uh, can be returned, and then we have an external independent ethics advisory council that's um, providing input as well. We've done a lot of work on provider and patient support and education, and from our initial analysis, we estimate that um, about 3.5% of the participants who are sequenced will have an actionable actionable variant in one of the genes um, that we've targeted. <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time uh, creating um, what we could believe is an appropriate ethical framework for this. <clears throat> it's really based on the three principles of uh, respect, trust, and care. And the care one is, um, the statement is that we will care for our participants by returning medically actionable results to them and to the healthcare professionals who care for them. So that's really the, the uh, sort of the ethical basis on which we're doing this. So part of the process is shown here. So the samples go through this normal sequencing pipeline um, that generates variant call files. Uh, then they go through a, a, a special bioinformatic filtering to identify potential, uh, uh, well, to identify pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in that list of, of 76 genes we call the Geisinger 76. Um, so that's all done in a non-CLIA, non-clinical laboratory environment <clears throat> for um, variants that um, sort of meet the threshold and raise a very conservative threshold for determining pathogenicity. Then uh, that information then triggers the release of a second DNA sample from our um, CLIA biobank to the clinical lab where we do um, confirmatory testing to, uh, to make sure that the variant is indeed present. If it's there and they almost always uh, are confirmed, that generates a clinical molecular report uh, that's uh, generated and given to uh, the patient's provider and deposited in their electronic health record. And then we also have a, a separate process for engaging and, and, and sharing that information with the patients. So really, it's a, it's a team-based effort uh, in terms of returning these results that involves the patient, first and foremost, uh, their primary care provider, we have genomic medicine specialists available uh, for consultations if needed. And then we pull in clinical subspecialists uh, when appropriate. So three conditions um, we estimate will account for about half of the results that are returned. Uh, they're listed here. So it's familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, which is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, and then Lynch syndrome which is another um, early um, onset um, colon and uterine cancer um, syndrome. And so these are the estimated prevalence we, we have in the population. Um, and then what can be done in terms of disease management. Um, so I'm going to show now a little bit more detailed data on what we're doing in, uh, on FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, because I think it's, it's, it's informative of how, um, how useful this information can be. So within um, the 50,000 plus individuals uh, that have been sequenced, um, we found a, a, an FH um, pathogenic variant in 236 of them, which uh, calculates to a prevalence of about 1 in 215. Now, if you stratify um, the prevalence of the FH positive variant by where the patients were um, enrolled, so if they were enrolled through our cardiac catheterization lab here at Geisinger, and then compare those to anybody enrolled in any other clinic at Geisinger, uh, not surprisingly, we see an enrichment of the FH positive variants in the cardiac um, uh, clinics. And then if we stratify by uh, LDL cholesterol measures, and we're using here maximum lifetime LDL, from those that are less than 155, greater than 155, greater than 190, greater than 250, or greater than 330. See that um, the numbers get smaller, but the uh, frequency at which we're finding FH positive variants goes up substantially. So that for those individuals that have these very high LDL cholesterol levels, 
uh, one in three have a genetically determined um, FH positive variant that uh, accounts for their disease. So we're now using this um, information to work with the patients and their cardiologists to make sure that they're being appropriately managed. And the reason that's important is, is illustrated in this slide and, and, and the next, and that is that these individuals have a very high risk of uh, developing um, coronary disease. And I just want to highlight, um, especially if you stratify for those who have um, early MI, so men less than age 55 and women uh, less than age 65, the odds ratio for individuals that carry uh, one of these FH variants uh, for coronary disease is, is more than six, with a very significant p-value. And again, this is showing um, similar data, but stratified by the variants. You can see that um, a lot of this is driven by variants in the LDL receptor. That's the most common um, FH uh, pathogenic variant that we're finding in our population. But um, for those that have an LDLR uh, predicted loss of function variant, again, the, the odds ratio for a coronary artery disease is more than five. Uh, we're also finding variants in ApoB and PCSK9, the two other um, variants. And if you look at the, the early CAD cases, um, again, the, for the LDLR loss of function variants, the risk of um, the odds ratio for CAD is, is more than 10. So again, these people are at extremely high risk for, um, for um, serious heart disease, and we're now using this information to identify them and then ensure that they're being appropriately uh, cared for, um, for medically. So, um, all on that. So just to wrap up, um, the, the, this collaboration between Geisk and Regeneron has created um, what we think is a unique platform for research to validate and identify associations between genes and genetic variants and important clinical traits. So there's a large um, sort of discovery research component to this. Um, but it also provides uh, the resources to um, try to begin to implement uh, genomic information in clinical care in a large clinical setting. And I, and I think I've shown examples of, of, of both the, sort of the discovery research use and the, uh, and the clinical implementation use. Um, we're also very aware of um, all the discussion now about what's called precision medicine. Um, so this is some uh, language taken from the NIH Precision Medicine website. It's an approach for disease treatment that takes into account individual variability. Um, we're focusing on the genetic aspects of that. We'd also like to extend this now to look at other uh, sort of lifestyle factors and environment factors. Um, and then um, from uh, a perspective written by Francis Collins and Harold Varmus uh, on the precision medicine um, concept, um, so they described a longitudinal cohort, um, volunteers um, give consent for uh, characterization of specimens, including sequencing linked to electronic health records. So I think what I've hoped I've convinced you is uh, I, I think we're already doing precision medicine. Uh, we're very excited about where we are, but uh, even more excited about where we hope to go in the future. And uh, love to hear um, your feedback and comments. And uh, you know, also very supportive of others that are trying to do this. We know it's going to take a very large uh, effort to to make this a reality, but. Um, Again, I want to thank you for the in invitation to share what we've done, and uh, I think I'll just close by listing a few of the people who've contributed to this. Obviously, it's been a very large effort, both at Geisinger and at Regeneron. Um, and with that, I think I will conclude. Thank you, David. That was a uh, very fascinating uh, overview of the work that you are doing. I would um, like to, um, you know, go to the questions um, and then, uh, well, if there's anything uh, thereafter, we'll uh, discuss. So um, the first question is, uh, uh, says, thanks, uh, thank you for the elaborate presentation. Just want to know whether these, uh, there was any incentive provided to participants of the MyCode? Uh, was there any particular concern highlighted by the patients who opted to stay out of my code? Those are the two questions. Okay, now very good questions. 
So the patients do not receive an incentive. Um, when we started this back in 2006, uh, we did some patient focus groups and then followed up with some survey um, questionnaires uh, to get sort of our patients' perception on um, and their attitudes about participating in a program like this. And, and we, we were pleased by the, the feedback, and that is most patients said, yes, this is something I would do. I don't expect to be compensated financially. I'll do it. Uh, yes, I understand I probably won't benefit directly, but I'm willing to do it for the common good and, and really um, you know, for, for the good of my children and my grandchildren. So I think it's a, it's a very altruistic um, sort of um, attitude on the part of our patients, and we're very grateful to them for that. And I think that's been borne out in our experience ever since then. Um, you, know, the, you know, about 85% of the patients who we invite um, agree to participate. We have had some that have withdrawn over the, over the years, but that number is very small. And um, I, I think that the usual reason that patients give for either not participating or withdrawing is concerns over, over privacy. Um, and again, when they tell us, you know, we don't want, they don't want to sign up or they want to withdraw, we just say, thank you, um, that's, that's fine, we respect um, your decision. So, so no, they're not compensated and, um, um, and I think they just do it really um, because they, they want to contribute to something that they think can bring good. Did I answer the question? Um, I think so. Uh, yes. So I think this altruistic motive is there um, everywhere, isn't it? Like even, uh, you know, um, uh, if you were to look at the population even in Sri Lanka, the altruistic motive uh, plays a big role. There's a second question, which is, um, uh, what are the plans of extending my code, uh, the MyCode project? Any plans uh, for international implementation? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So, um, so within Geisinger, we are continuing to expand, and so um, I mentioned we're still actively enrolling. We have, you know, I think our next milestone is 200 or 250,000 Geisinger patients. Um, we, we've had a number of conversations with folks uh, at places, um, you know, both within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. about trying to. Um, to do, you know, to sort of replicate my code there. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I do have a personal vested interest in this because um, I've been, uh, I helped start it and been with it for so long and we're very proud of it and we think it's a great system. Um, you know, we, we're happy to talk to people and, and uh, you know, I think um, help them learn from what we've, um, you know, encountered over the years and you know, share with them what we think works, uh, what hasn't worked for us. Um, and, and again, you know, very. Uh, and again, I, to reach, um, you know, to, to really make precision medicine a reality is going to require extremely large cohorts of patients and, and you know participants in these types of projects. So, um, uh, so I guess we 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 don't have any confirmed plans to um, sort of export or, or replicate this outside of Geisinger, but we are talking to another number of other um, other places. Okay, David, thanks. A question from me. I was just wondering, um, and now um, the uh, research part of it obviously is funded, but however, uh, what about the, uh, now once you are returning that uh, results um, in the Geisinger 76 panel, uh, does insurance come to pay to uh, do the, uh, you know, validation in the CLIA lab? Um, how does it work? Okay. Yeah. So the, um, so the, uh, the sequencing and the uh, initial validation, so the initial CLIA validation and the initial um, encounters to uh, engage with the patients to return the results and give it to their providers. All that's done free of charge to the participants. But then anything that happens subsequent to that uh, is the responsibility of the patient's insurance company. So for example, if we return a result 
uh, so a BRCA1 positive result to uh, to a woman, and then her physician recommends that she do regular um, screening tests, for example. Those screening tests that are done as a consequence of having this information would be the responsibility of, of her insurance company. But the creating the result and the initial return of the result um, there's no charge to the patients or their insurance companies for that. All right, so um, and that's very clear. Um, so has that model worked uh, without any hitch? Um, has there been situations where the insurance uh, insurance company has refused to um, reimburse? Um, so far we haven't run into any major problems that we're aware of. Um, <laughs> The, the interesting thing is um, there have been a small number of patients who we've approached about returning this information, and they weren't interested in getting it. Uh, All right. Uh, but that's really up, that's their decision. Um, <laughs> but I'm, well, and then we do have a way, so we've worked with some private foundations, so we do have a fund that can be used to pay for some of these follow-on tests. Um, if they're medically um, required and the patient doesn't have, or their insurance company um, refuses to pay for it. But I'm not aware that we've had to use that um, really much at all yet. All right. Okay, David, I don't see any other questions. Pamot, do you see any other questions? Um, so that's all for the moment. Right. David, we have come to the end of our uh, hour on the platform, so therefore we need to sign off. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, uh, uh, all of us who participated in the webinar uh, this evening, it was a fascinating um, insight into um, the work that you are doing, the excellent work that's happening, and uh, we look forward to um, perhaps uh, listening to an update of this, uh, maybe another year down the line, and um, uh, we would probably have uh, more fascinating uh, data information for us. Thank you very much uh, to you and your team, David. Bye. Thank you. It was my pleasure.